The theme of abandonment often involves the vulnerable, particularly women and children, who are left behind by those who are either powerful and merciless or careless and short-sighted. Classical mythology provides stark examples. Oedipus, left to die on a mountain by his father's decree, and Ariadne, deserted on an island by her lover Theseus. The reasons behind abandonment vary. Oedipus was abandoned due to a prophecy that he would kill his father, while Moses was left in the Nile to save him from the Pharaoh's edict to kill all Hebrew male infants. In Victorian genre paintings, indigent mothers might leave their babies at the doorstep of the wealthy or at a foundling hospital, hoping for a better life for their child. The outcomes of abandonment also differ. While some like Dido are driven to despair, others like Psyche seek reconciliation with their abandoner. In many narratives, as in the stories of Ariadne or Olympia, the abandoned woman was rescued by another man who pitied her plight and fell in love with her. John Boswell has shown that the abandonment in myth and literature mirrors historical realities, with children being abandoned for family limitation until the 19th century. Sometimes as many as a third of all born children were abandoned, often with the hope of adoption. Abandonment wasn't limited to children. Women too were often left by husbands and lovers, a reality that persists. Art has frequently depicted abandoned figures like Moses and Oedipus. Moses, for instance, has been portrayed by Nicholas Pesen and others, often focusing on his discovery rather than his abandonment. The theme of abandonment has one meaning of being left or forsaken, and another of giving oneself over to an unusual and all-encompassing emotion that often drives the victim to antisocial behavior. Abandonment leads to excessive grief that offends society and turn it against the victim. The outsider position, in turn, frees the abandoned one from social rules and renders her more free and powerful. As a popular song describes the situation, Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. The Infant Moses by Gustave Moreau is a work that is characteristic of the artist's symbolist approach, blending biblical narrative with a rich, imaginative landscape. The composition here is structured to lead the eye from the foreground, where the infant Moses rests, towards the background of ancient architectural ruins. The river acts as a guiding line, directing our gaze through the painting. This compositional technique creates depth and suggests the journey that Moses will undertake in his life. Taking a step back, we notice the ghostly figures in the middle ground, almost blending into the architecture of the ruins. These phantasmagoric images of past pharaohs serve as a poignant reminder of the old world's decrepit ideologies. The subtlety with which Moreau renders these figures suggests that their era is waning, their presence fading as surely as the crumbling edifices that house them. The use of colour in this painting is quite evocative. Moreau opts for a warm golden light that illuminates the infant, making him the focal point of the piece. This divine light suggests the future importance of Moses in his biblical role. The surrounding flora and fauna are painted with rich, dark hues which contrast with the luminosity of the child, enhancing his significance in the image. There is a dreamlike quality to Moreau's depiction of the ruins and the natural environment. This is characteristic of Moreau's style, where the line between reality and imagination is often blurred. The fantastical elements in the painting, such as the oversized flora, and the ancient ruins 
are typical of symbolist art, which seeks to express the mystical or the ineffable. Textures are rendered with meticulous detail, particularly in the basket's intricate weave and the individual petals and leaves of the plants. This attention to detail adds a layer of realism within the dreamy atmosphere of the piece. The emotional tone of the painting is one of serene tranquility. Moses is depicted in a state of peaceful sleep, unaware of the grand destiny before him. The surrounding scenery, while impressive and somewhat foreboding with its crumbling edifices and overgrown plants, does not disturb the infant. Instead, it seems to stand as a silent witness to the momentous beginning of a great story. Moreau's use of symbolism is prevalent in this work. The baby Moses, exposed and vulnerable, yet illuminated and serene, represents innocence protected by divine providence. The water's surface, dotted with flowers and creatures, may signify the world's dangers and beauties that await him. Ariadne's tale is one of love, betrayal and redemption, woven into the fabric of Greek mythology. Daughter of King Minos of Crete, Ariadne falls deeply in love with Theseus, the Athenian hero who ventures into the labyrinth to slay the Minotaur. After aiding Theseus with a thread to navigate the labyrinth, she flees with him, only to be abandoned on the island of Naxos. Her story does not end in despair, however, Dionysus, the god of wine and ecstasy, discovers and marries her, lifting her from abandonment to divine companionship. Ariadne in Naxos, painted by Evelyn de Morgan in 1877, is a compelling rendition of a classical Greek myth presented through the lens of the British pre-Raphaelite movement. De Morgan's painting portrays the moment of Ariadne's realization of her solitude, using her posture and expression to convey a deep-rooted sense of betrayal and heartache. The symbolism in this piece is layered and evocative. Ariadne's red dress is a vibrant focal point, suggesting passion and love, which is ironically juxtaposed with her forsaken state. While the golden drapery beneath her hints at her royal lineage and foreshadows her eventual deification at the hands of the god Dionysus. The setting of the painting reinforces the theme of isolation. The beach of Naxos is rendered with a quiet realism. The serene sea contrasts sharply with Ariadne's inner tumult. The barren cliffs create a sense of confinement further emphasizing her abandonment. De Morgan's meticulous attention to detail, evident in the realistic textures of the sand, seashells, and the drapery of the garments, exemplifies the pre-Raphaelite's dedication to naturalism and precision. Evelyn De Morgan's role as one of the few prominent female pre-Raphaelite artists adds another layer to the interpretation of this painting. Love in a Tangle by Edward Byrne Jones offers a rich experience in art appreciation as it encompasses various elements of style and technique inherent to the artist's work. Compositionally, the artwork is circular, a choice that can evoke the concept of infinity or continuity, possibly alluding to the endless nature of the labyrinth mentioned in the narrative. The circular format also gives a sense of intimacy and focus, drawing the viewer's eye to the central figure of Ariadne. The use of space is interesting. The figure is placed off-center, which creates a dynamic tension within the frame. The color palette is subdued, with a limited range of hues that evoke a dreamlike, ethereal quality. Byrne Jones uses soft tones of white and gray accentuated by the golden threads and the dark, rich greens of the foliage to create contrast. 
The use of gold not only references the golden thread from the myth of Theseus and Ariadne, but also adds a precious, almost divine aspect to the piece, which is characteristic of Byrne Jones' work. The watercolour medium, known for its translucence, is masterfully manipulated to layer tones and build up the composition without losing the delicate nature of the scene. Texturally, Byrne Jones achieves a contrast between the smooth, flowing lines of Ariadne's gown and the intricate, almost tactile depiction of the surrounding foliage and maze. It's worth noting that the foliage could represent plants with tangled vines that complement the painting's title and narrative. The emotional tone conveyed by Ariadne's posture and the tranquil setting is one of quiet anticipation and perhaps a melancholic premonition, reflecting the eventual fate of her love story. The use of light and shadow, the drapery of her gown, and her downcast eyes all contribute to this atmosphere. The narrative of Jesus Christ encompasses the most profound themes of abandonment and redemption, resonating through centuries of theological discourse and artistic representation. His journey, from being celebrated as a king to being forsaken on the cross, embodies the ultimate expression of abandonment. The most poignant moment of abandonment is captured in Jesus' own words on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The betrayal Originating from the turn of the 14th century, it is a seminal piece by Duccio, who is acclaimed for his pivotal role in the Sienese school of painting. The fresco captures a moment of profound drama and emotion. The betrayal of Jesus by Judas Iscariot, identified by the infamous kiss that leads to Jesus' arrest. This scene is a cornerstone of Christian iconography, epitomizing both treachery and the beginning of the Passion of Christ. Duccio's composition draws the viewer's gaze to the central act of betrayal, using the surrounding figures to frame this pivotal moment. The layout reflects the medieval style, where the emphasis is more on storytelling rather than accurate spatial representation. The color scheme is characteristic of the era, dominated by muted earth tones and the radiant use of gold, which signifies divinity and sanctity, especially evident in the halos. Remarkably, Duccio infuses the fresco with a spectrum of human emotions. The diversity of responses among Jesus' followers, ranging from shock to outrage, adds to the intensity of the scene. Duccio's ability to convey such expressiveness was revolutionary, marking a departure from the static Byzantine style that preceded him. The betrayal is particularly notable for its early adoption of emotional narrative and a hint of the three-dimensional portrayal of figures, a significant advancement that would later flourish in Renaissance art. The treacherous kiss, normally a sign of love and respect, becomes a symbol of the ultimate deception. Duccio's skillful delineation of this irony is a testament to his mastery as a storyteller through art. The Christening, painted by Emma Brownlow in 1863, is an illuminating portrayal of Victorian philanthropy and compassion set against the backdrop of the Thomas Coram Foundation for Children in London. Emma Brownlow brings to life the ritual of the christening ceremony with meticulous detail and emotional depth. The scene unfolds within the walls of the institution known for rescuing abandoned children, with the ceremony symbolizing their acceptance into a caring community and granting them an identity. The technical mastery of Brownlow is evident in her strategic use of light, which bathes the infant's nurses 
and the officiating clergyman in a warm, almost divine glow, contrasting the sombre tones of the surrounding onlookers and the rich interior. This interplay of light not only serves to focus the viewer's attention on the ceremony, but also imbues the scene with a sense of hope and spiritual rebirth. The white robes of the clergyman and the christening gowns of the infants emerge brightly against the darker hues, signifying purity and a new beginning for the orphaned children. Brownlow's attention to the subtleties of facial expression and posture among the figures in the christening conveys a solemnity fitting for the occasion. The expressions are composed, reflecting the gravity of the sacrament and the decorous behaviour that was characteristic of the era. The artist's attention to detail is notable in the depiction of clothing and the architectural elements of the room. These details are not merely for authenticity but speak to the Victorian eye for order and propriety. The inclusion of religious artwork in the background adds a layer of religious context tying the present ceremony to a continuum of faith and community. Beyond the technical, Brownlow's work is steeped in symbolism and social commentary. The act of christening these children, once abandoned and now under the Foundation's care, serves as a powerful narrative of the period's societal values. Clothing the children at the Holy Ghost Orphanage Harbum, crafted in 1663 by the Dutch artist Jan de Bray, is a poignant work of art that also serves as a revealing window into the ethos of 17th century Dutch society. Today, it is housed in the Franz Hals Museum, located in the very city depicted in the painting. This painting's humanitarian theme stands as a powerful depiction of charity capturing a moment of compassion within the community life of Harlem. It moves away from the typical depictions of elite or mythological subjects, characteristic of the Dutch Golden Age, to focus on the day-to-day -day reality and societal values. The composition itself is engaging, with figures arranged in a semicircle around the focal point. A woman clothing a boy. This setup invites viewers into the painting's emotional core. The dramatic use of lighting, known as tenebrism, a Baroque signature, creates stark contrasts of light and shadow that lend the figures a sculptural quality. Debray's nuanced colour scheme strikes a delicate balance between warm and cool tones, echoing the naturalistic style of the time. His meticulous rendering of textures particularly in the textiles, showcases his impressive attention to detail. The painting is rich with symbolic gestures and expressions. The caregivers radiate a dignified compassion that speaks to their noble work, while the children's diverse expressions reveal a range of personal narratives and emotions. Jan de Bray is noted for his unique approach of integrating contemporary individuals into historical or allegorical contexts, a technique known as historiated portraits. This painting exemplifies that approach, merging portraiture with genre painting. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. Thank you.